The majority of Trainsim World's UK routes are set in England, with only three in Scotland and still nothing in Wales or Northern Ireland at the time of uploading. The newest Scottish route is the Fife Circle Line, and for the longest time, I wasn't sure whether or not I would pick up this add-on, considering that Rivet Games are behind it, and you should all know my thoughts on this developer by now. But I realised that there are people who would probably like to hear my thoughts on the route anyway, so here I am, looking at a Rivet Games product that, surprisingly, is not complete trash for once. To be clear, even though Rivet Games has a very poor track record, that doesn't mean I automatically hate every single thing they release, nor am I trying to bully them, despite what some people still may think. The thing is, at this point, they've pretty much shattered their own reputation despite having many chances to improve themselves, and it'll take a lot of work to repair that reputation. Ironically, my favourite TSW route is still a Rivet Games product, namely Island Line 2022. And now, we'll see what the Five Circle is like regardless of my semi-pessimistic attitude. This add-on was released on March 27th, 2024, only one week after the London Overground Goblin line, and I think that releasing two add-ons so close together was a very dumb idea on Dovetail's part. Five Circle costs a staggering 57 New Zealand dollars at the normal price, but I got it on pre-order for $51.29. That's a measly 10% off, but I suppose a microscopic discount is better than paying full price again. In any case, given how expensive the routes are, it's not unreasonable to expect them to be made to a high standard. And these days, I rarely hold my breath over the possibility of any add-ons being anywhere near good, but that begs the question as to why the quality and size of TSW add-ons often very rarely matches the price. Take the disastrous New York to Trenton route and Arosa Aggregates gameplay pack as examples. As for route coverage, it's actually decent. You get the line from Edinburgh Waverley to Mark Hinch, going via either Dunfermline or Kirkcaldy. The alternative route via Dunfermline and Codenbeath branches off at Inverkeithing and rejoins the main line at a junction between Glenrothes with Thornton and Mark Hinch. Part of the route already appears in TSW as part of ScotRail Express, the Edinburgh to Glasgow Queen Street route. That add-on was also made by Rivet Games, and they released it in January 2023, but I don't like it for a few reasons. It's only 47 miles long with no branches, only offers one full service, and only includes one train, in the form of the Class 385 electric multiple unit. The empty services to and from Glasgow Eastfield Depot don't count as a branch line because the depot is right next to the main line. Five Circle trains share the Edinburgh Waverley to Haymarket section with the Class 385s, but branch off before reaching Edinburgh Park Station. Instead, their first stop after Haymarket is South Guile. A total of 20 stations are featured on the Five Circle, and the total route length is a tolerable 52 miles. Three notable landmarks along the line are Edinburgh Castle, Murrayfield Stadium, and the Fourth Rail Bridge the latter being one of the most famous railway bridges in the world. Construction started in 1882, and the bridge was completed in 1889, ahead of its official opening in December 1890. It's a cantilever structure that measures an impressive 2.467 kilometres long, with Dalmany Station at its southern end and North Queens Ferry at its northern end. On the motive power scene, it's the usual story where a modern TSW route only includes one train, and I've come to accept that at this point, despite not liking the one train per route thing at all. This time, we get the long-awaited Class 170 Turbostar in the ScotRail Saltire livery, and this is the third ScotRail train we've seen in TSW, after the Class 314 and Class 385 EMUs. 
The Class 170 is a common DMU throughout most of the UK, but of course, they can't run in Northern Ireland due to incompatible track gauges. 139 examples of this class were built by Adatrans and, later, Bombardier Transportation between 1998 and 2005. They come in either two or three car formations, and with a top speed of 100 miles per hour, they're ideal for longer distance regional services. Places served by the 170s include, but are not limited to, Dundee, Edinburgh, Knaresborough, York, Nottingham, Birmingham, Hereford, and Cardiff. For a more in-depth look at the 170s in real life, I recommend watching Maverick Hunter Daniel's Railway Review to the Turbo Stars. Skyhook Games are also making a ScotRail Class 158 add-on for the Fife Circle line, but it wasn't released at the same time as the base route, and a dovetail put it in the 4-6 to six months section of the March 2024 roadmap. Go figure. We already have one variant of the Class 158 in TSW, namely the East Midlands Trains Unit that comes with Skyhook's criminally short, but otherwise decent, Midlands Main Line Leicester to Derby and Nottingham route, and I suspect that their Scott Rail 158 reskin will just be released as another overpriced gameplay pack. For reference, the Scott Rail 158 you're looking at now is in Train Simulator Classic, and it comes with Armstrong Powerhouse's Class 158 and 159 Cummins Enhancement Pack, which was built on Dovetail's Network Southeast Class 159 model. And these scenes of the Scott Rail Class 158 were recorded on the Inverness to Kyle of LaColche route in Train Simulator. It was made by Just Trains, and you can buy it on Steam or from JT's website. For anyone wondering why the Class 68 diesel locomotive and Mark II coaches are not included, I'm pretty sure it's because the Fife Circle route in TSW takes place after ScotRail stopped using locomotive hauled stock on this run. At least, I think that's the case. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong. All I know on this front is that the real 68006 Daring and 68007 Valiant, the only two 68s that ever carried the Saltire livery, are no longer in said livery. For the most part, Rivet did a decent job of modelling the Class 170, although that's coming from someone who is, by no means, an expert on these things. But to me, something looks off about the shape of the cab front, in the sense that it just looks a little bit too narrow. Annoyingly, Rivet only modelled one variant of the headlight clusters, namely the larger Phase 2 lights. The model in-game pretty much always appears with the numbers of units that, in real life, actually have the older and smaller Phase 1 light clusters, and I hate seeing them with the wrong lights. Rivet should have scripted their 170 model to only display unit numbers ranging from 17393 to 17396, then 17425 to 17434, 17450 to 17461, and 17472 to 17478. Those are the Scottish 170s that actually have Phase 2 lights. For context, this is what a 170 looks like with those older lights, alongside another unit with the newer lights. I have no preference out of the two, and the same goes for the Class 375 and Class 377, two EMUs of which we still only have one variant each in TSW. Apparently, Rivets was unable to 3D scan a unit with the older lights, but don't quote me on that. In any case, I'm still quite put out by the lack of the Phase 1 lights on the TSW version. For reference, these shots of 17406 and 17432, as well as the Class 68 and Mark II coaches that you saw earlier, were taken on the Marsdenshire route in TS Classic. Much like Inverness to Kyle of LaColche, Marsdenshire was also made by Just Trains, and you can still buy it on Steam or from JT's website. As for these 170s, they are from the Armstrong Powerhouse Class 168, 170 and 171 enhancement pack, which was built on the old Thomson Interactive model after it was sold to Dovetail. Mm. 
Besides the different light clusters and a basic outline of her history, another thing I know about the Class 170 is her use of six-cylinder MTU prime movers, with one engine per coach, but the specific prime mover's name is clunky and harder to remember. My initial impression of the 170's sounds in TSW were mixed. While I think that the door beeps and the horn are fine, the engines are a little too quiet. If anyone's seen footage of a real 170 leaving a station, you'll know that those engines absolutely scream. Driving the 170 is a better experience than I was expecting. While the engine sounds aren't exactly spot on, the physics are at least not cartoonishly overpowered. The issue with the camera being too close to the window with no option to adjust the field of view is not isolated to the 170, but it's still very annoying. In any case, this unit shares some traits with the later class 375, 377 and 387 electrostars. Hardly surprising given the common manufacturer. The one thing I don't like about driving on the Fife Circle is the tight timetable, where there isn't much padding and it's easy to end up running late. The 170 is reasonably fast, with a top speed of 100 miles per hour. But the only part of this route where the speed limit is actually 100 is a short section between Dolmeny and Edinburgh Gateway and the 170's acceleration rate is too slow to reach 100 on that section before having to slow down for the next station or speed limit reduction. For the rest of the route north of Dolmany, the speed limit varies between 30 and 80 miles per hour. As for timetable mode, it includes 154 playable services for the Class 170. Someone told me a few days before release that the timetable was incomplete, based on what they saw in the preview livestream. I was curious about this, and went to look for the December 2023 timetable on ScotRail's website for comparison. The real timetable shows that, in addition to the services going to or coming from Perth and Dundee via Kirkcaldy, there are hourly services out of Edinburgh that only go as far as Glenrothes with Thornton. I thought that the trains going to Glenrothes with Thornton via Dunfermline would continue round the other side of the loop and back to Edinburgh that way, but there is no crossover at the eastern end of the station, only at the western end. Most of the in-game services are between 50 and 70 minutes long, apart from the shunt services at Glenrothes with Thornton. Rivets included the Edinburgh to Perth and Dundee services as well as the actual five circle services to and from Glenrothes with Thornton but I don't know if there are any services in the game that let you drive from Edinburgh, round the circle and back to Edinburgh in one shot. Annoyingly, you can't do empty stock movements to and from Haymarket's depot, despite it being right next to the main line. For anyone who owns the ScotRail Express and ECML Peterborough to Doncaster add-ons, you'll also see the ScotRail Class 385 and LNER Class 801 EMUs on AI-only services at Edinburgh Waverley in timetable mode. The latter is an especially welcome addition, since she didn't appear at the station on the ScotRail Express version, for whatever reason. But even with the Class 385 and Class 801 added, Edinburgh Waverley still looks and feels like a ghost town, despite its sheer size. The rail scene on this route is pretty boring, especially after you branch off from the line to Glasgow Queen Street. There are no freight or rail tour services at all, and it's pretty dull seeing only 170s for most of the run. Besides Edinburgh Waverley, another notable station on this route is Edinburgh Gateway. It's one of the newest stations on the line, having opened in 2016. In addition to serving the nearby Guile shopping centre, the station is also an interchange with the Edinburgh trams. And speaking of which, Gogard Depot is located just west of the station. In real life, 
The tram line now continues past Goga Depot and on to Edinburgh Airport, so I'm guessing this route is supposed to take place before that extension was built. Although it's harder to see from the station, unless you get on a train and go to the free roam camera, Rivet didn't bother adding overhead catenary for the tram line here. I wonder if they left it like this because of how difficult it is to see from the railway station, and maybe they thought that no one would be smart enough to investigate. In any case, assuming that people wouldn't think to investigate the matter is no excuse for inaccurate scenery. Oh, and once again, we're stuck with the wrong motive power type representing the Edinburgh trams. In real life, they're actually CAF Airbus 3s, not this bootleg Stadler Variobahn thingy. Despite being close to an airport, you don't see any planes in the sky as you're departing from or arriving at Edinburgh Gateway. It may shock some of you to learn that there are still more good aspects of the Fife Circle add-on. For starters, I like Kinghorn Station because of its location on a hill overlooking the coast, and this is pretty much tied with Burnt Island as being my favourite station on the whole route. I'm also impressed by the working escalators, which I first noticed at Edinburgh Gateway, and I thought the escalators would just be static objects again. However, and for whatever reason, Haymarket Station still has the old static slash non-functioning escalator model. Besides the working escalators, a couple of other things I like are A. This nice mosaic mural on Platform 2 at North Queens Ferry, and B. The automatic announcements aboard the Class 170. But that doesn't mean I instantly forgive Rivet only modelling the Phase 2 headlights instead of adding Phase 1 as well. Just west of Murrayfield Stadium, the main line runs right past Ball Green tram stop. Needless to say, this in-game rendition looks absolutely nothing like the real Ball Green. It is laughably bad. When I was exploring Dolmany Station, I noticed this bus parked near the roundabout between Ross Hill Terrace, Burdock Road, Station Road, and Ashburnham alone. I swear this is the same bus model that appears on the Arosa line, specifically in that section where the railway runs through the streets of Coor. At South Gyle, there's a large, for want of a better term, mound of terrain along each platform. They both look awful due to the 2D texture and almost complete lack of proper foliage. And while I was exploring South Gyle Station, I noticed these NPCs stuck in a bunch at the spawn points on the nearby road, instead of walking to the station like they should be doing. Meanwhile, at Burnt Island, I was genuinely shocked to see that two of the station signs here say Glasgow Queen Street instead. I question how the developers could have missed such a basic error, and how much testing was really done before this route was released. Although the stations are well modelled, for the most part, the scenery quality drops considerably from the moment you look beyond the immediate trackside surroundings, and indeed, quite often I see the same building assets copied and pasted over and over again. And of course, the foliage is a hit or miss. As an example of a badder spot, I noticed lots of huge fields between Rosyth and Caldenbeath that don't have any proper details, just the flat 2D texture instead. And the big field next to Dunfermline Queen Margaret Station doesn't look too good either. One time, when I stopped at Caldenbeath, I noticed NPCs from the opposite platform walking onto the track and over to my train. I noticed a massive stadium next to the track between Kirkaldy and Kinghorn. A quick bit of research tells me that this is Starks Park, home of the Wraith Rovers football club, whoever they are. The line through Kinghorn, Burnt Island and Abadawa has some charming coastal scenery, and I prefer this side of the route over the inland line via Dunfermline. The performance on this route can be inconsistent. The frame rate normally hovers between 60 and 110 FPS, but there's occasional stuttering and lag, even though questionable optimization is inexcusable on a route that costs 57 New Zealand dollars at full price.
Just because Rivet Games made a decent route this time, they are not entirely off the hook because they still have that track record of all their low quality add-ons, and the Arosa line is especially bad. A few days before the Fife Circle released, I saw a dovetail post on Facebook with the preview of the driver's perspective across the fourth bridge, and the comments section, not the one hosted by Brett Cooper this time, mostly consisted of the usual glowing praise from the fanboys or people complaining about others moaning, and essentially telling the critics to shut up and enjoy the product anyway. Uh, sorry guys, that's not how this works. The developers should still be held accountable when they do something wrong. They can't improve their, for want of a better word, craft, if everyone blindly goes along with everything they do without questioning anything. Anyone outside the TSW community would think this is a sodding dictatorship, but I'm still going to speak my mind while the fanboys continue to isolate themselves in their echo chamber. Despite the issues I've found with this route, and the Class 170 Turbo Star, I think the Fife Circle add-on is actually decent, or at the very least, tolerable, which is a very rare thing for Rivet's Games DLC. For one thing, this route is better than Scott Rail Express because it's non-linear and a little bit longer, not to mention one major highlight in the form of the fourth rail bridge. The 170 is also fun to drive, and I look forward to Skyhook's Scott Rail Class 158 add-on as well, since that should make the route a little better. At the end of the day, all I want is for the game, its developers, and a DLC to reach their full potential. I don't see how that can be done when the developers continue to maintain the status quo of releasing often lacklustre products while still receiving unwavering praise from the fanboys, and, by comparison, almost giving the cold shoulder to the passionate critics.